Bienvenidos, bienvenidas, bienvenidos. Welcome, welcome to our event, which you welcome Oscar Lopez. We are, it's a day of joy, it's a day of celebration for all of us. We know that Oscar is here because of his strength, because of his work, but, and also because of the international campaign that happened. Puerto Ricans in the diaspora working together with Puerto Ricans uh, in the islands and our allies and accomplices who help us lead this campaign to have Oscar here. And we want to acknowledge that many of you here, Wister was part of this campaign, and we want to acknowledge that, you know, it's, we were part of this victory that we had. So we're really happy that um, you're here. Um, so we're going to sing La Boriqueña. This is the Puerto Rican national anthem. It's what some people call the revolutionary anthem, which is indeed our anthem. Um, and we're going to have Taina Siri, um, an activist, artist, singer, who's going to sing. And we can all follow. Let's welcome Taina.
kind of like so much of what your life and your struggle you look on for encouragement and fighting. When you think about, you, you read about your hero, you hear about the news, you fight the struggle, but to be able to present today is something that I can't even put into words. I'm going to um, look to just give you a little information. So you look at who is Oscar Lopez Rivera. I'd, I'd like to say because Rivera, Rivera, Mundo, Rivera is like Smith. <laughs> I want to just say that he's also from San Sebastián and if you look at our family, there's a lot of people and he looks just like my uncle and my father, so I don't know. I see the word of the He's hailed as a pillar in the community organizing in Chicago and a leading voice of Puerto Rican nationalism. He was a community, he's, he is a community organized in Chicago, Puerto Rican community from the late 1960s throughout the 70s. His footprint can be felt on just about every intersection of Paseo Boricua, the section division street in Chicago West bookmark by the two by two fifty-nine foot tall Puerto Rican flags. His legacies include the creation of the Dr. Dr. Albizu Campo High School formed in 1972 in the basement of a church to address overcrowding and racism in public schools. At the time, the dropout rate for Puerto Rico was nearly 60% and the school system lacking by little education. The high school is now part of a Puerto Rican cultural district which includes the National Museum of Puerto Rican Arts and Culture. Oscar was drafted to fight in the Vietnam War in 1961 after being honorably discharged in 1967 and receiving a Bronze Star for his bravery. Oscar enrolled in the University of Illinois of Chicago. As a student, he and others demanded the creation of programs aimed at recruiting and retaining Latino students. He also fought for affordable housing and helped found a free halfway house and an educational program for Latino prisoners. Now, at the age of 75, Oscar Lopez Rivera was the longest held political prisoner in Puerto Rican history. He was charged with sedition conspiracy 36 years ago for his participation in Puerto Rican independence movement. The same charge that former South African President Nelson Mandela spent 25 years in prison for before being elected president. Olga was never accused or convicted of hurting anyone or participating in any violent crime, only for fighting for his country to be free. Woo! In 1999, President Bill Clinton commuted Oscar Lopez Rivera to this proportionate 70 year sentence, but Olga refused the commutation because two of his co co-defendant remain in prison. Olga was offered clemency once again in January 2017 by then President Barack Obama in response to a worldwide campaign. Olga Lopez spent 36 years in prison but his release came at a time of tremendous turmoil for Puerto Rico. It is an honor to be able to present and I would ask you to please stand onto your feet as we welcome my hero, your hero, our hero, Olga Lopez Rivera to the stage. Good evening, good evening to all of you. Buenas noches, buenas noches a todos y a todas. Yo, yo he dicho que amar a Puerto Rico no cuesta nada. Lo costoso sería si lo perdemos. Agradecerte a todos Puerto Rico, cosa, no fui. 
or be costly to all for the business is if we lose by the people. Colonialism, colonialism is a crime against humanity. And no country has the right to possess another country and no right and have, no country has the right to colonize other countries. Puerto Rico has had the unfortunate experience of not ever having had the opportunity to be an independent and sovereign nation. So when we struggle, when we struggle for Puerto Rican independence, we're struggling against a crime against humanity. I would like for people to know that. But I would also like to know this, that on the 17th of May last year, when I came out of, out of home confinement, I told all Puerto Ricans that in order for us to decolonize Puerto Rico, if we love Puerto Rico, if we love our culture, if we love our way of life, if we love our language, then it behooves all of us to do everything possible to decolonize Puerto Rico. We have a history of struggling. And probably one of the struggles at the end of the 20th century was to get the U.S. Navy out of Vieques. And it was the last struggle, but mostly all Puerto Ricans came together with, with the acceptance that we can celebrate difference, differences and come together. We can transcend differences and come together. And Vieques, Vieques is that perfect example of us coming together in order to eradicate a problem that was really, really destroying Vietnam and its people. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we still have Vietnam with the contamination, with the problems that were created by the presence of the U.S. Navy in Vietnam. We still have the province of Vietnam that if we compare Vieques to Puerto Rico with the level of cancer, it is probably five times higher in Vieques than it is in Puerto Rico. And why should Puerto Ricans be suffering like that? And presently, presently, we're facing probably the most serious problems in Puerto Rico's history. <coughs> Two years ago, the U.S. government imposed something that is called La Junta de Control Fiscal, the Fiscal Control Board. And this Fiscal Control Board has one objective, only one objective, and that is to take out of Puerto Rico every dollar that needs to be taken out in order to pay for an odious debt, a criminal debt, because no Puerto Rican, no Puerto Rican, there's not a single Puerto Rican that can tell us how that debt was created and where that money was spent. And Puerto Ricans have asked for an audit more than once, more than twice, more than three times, more than four times, and we have been denied the right to have an audit on that debt. It's a $74 billion debt that Puerto Ricans have been forced, have been forced to pay. And I would like to share with you some of the things that have been taken out of Puerto Rico, things that are essential to the Puerto Rican people that have been taken away from us if the debt is paid. For example, one of the things that is being threatened right now is the education, the public education system. We have had last year, in August of last year, 157 schools were closed. This year, we are told that 283 schools will be closed. Now, education, 
education is how the human resource is developed. The human resource is the most important resource that we have in this world. It is the human being that has the potential to make this a better and more just world. It is the human being that also has that best side of making this a worse world than it should be. So, as we face this debt, and schools are being threatened, also the public university system in Puerto Rico is being threatened. We don't know how much money right now the tuition will be raised by by $100, by $150, but for a poor Puerto Rican to be able to be able to get into the university this coming year, the tuition will be much higher than last year. So if we don't have the money to pay for that tuition, what are we going to do? Historically, historically, there is a debt system that has been created for students in this nation. From probably 1985 to 2012, the students in this country had a debt of $1.9 trillion. Now, that's happening here. Now, in Puerto Rico, we cannot, we cannot afford we cannot afford to raise one penny on that tuition because we don't have the money. One of the things that has been promoted, and this is something that is to be of interest to young Puerto Ricans, is that the pay, the basic pay in Puerto Rico for young people from the ages of 18 to 25 will be raised, will be raised or will be lower to four dollars and fifty cents. I don't know how people can live on four dollars and fifty cents. When Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico cost of living is much higher than anywhere in the United States. So what is it that they want for the young people to do? Well, probably starve because with four thousand four thousand fifty cents an hour, that's not enough to live and have food and have shelter and you know what, what is it we're going to live out of the streets in Puerto Rico right now we see more and more people living living on sidewalks something that I had not said before before 1981 in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. so the problems are there the problems that we're facing are serious problems and then we have Hurricane Maria, and we, before that we had Hurricane Irma. And the devastation that Puerto Rico has endured is incredible. The only, the only good thing, the only good thing that we have seen out of, out of Hurricane Maria is that Puerto Ricans themselves, community by community, we have come to clean, we have come to help each other, we have done a lot of work, that nobody else was doing. Puerto Ricans, we were doing it neighborhood by neighborhood, area by area. And I was very proud and I felt good to see brothers and sisters, Puerto Rican brothers and sisters coming together to, to clean and to do the things that were necessary in order to at least alleviate and make conditions a little bit better right after the hurricane. Maria, Maria has done something that is interesting to her. Because for a long time, for a long time, public in Puerto Rico was not naked. It was hidden. We were, we were led to believe, we were led to believe that we were in good economic shape. And all of a sudden, with Hurricane Maria, we see how poverty, how much poverty there was in Puerto Rico. I had never been, I had never been in certain parts of Puerto Rico, like Barrio Venezuela, in Rio Piedra. I had not been in Barrio, Barrio Buen Consejo, in, 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 in Rio Piedras. I had not been, I had not been in Barrio Obrero, in Santurce. 
and all of a sudden I see this level of poverty. I see people, the worst living conditions that I had ever seen in my life. And I have been parts of this world where poverty had been very, very extreme. And I saw my Puerto Rican brothers and sisters living in those conditions. And young people, young people, kids, kids, not having what they needed, even as part of their diets. Now, I bring this to your attention because I think that it behooves every person, every person who loves justice and freedom, every person who really believes in democracy, every person who believes that human beings should live in dignity, with a quality of life that's decent, that can have access to education, that can have access to the medical needs, that can have access to a good life. And my primary reason here is to say, let's do it. We have human beings have the capacity to resolve, to deal with issues. <coughs> Problems that were created by mankind can be resolved because we created them. So it behooves, I think, it behooves every person who loves freedom and justice. Every person who thinks that colonialism should be raised from the face of the earth. Every, every person who thinks that we all deserve to live in a good, healthy environment. That every person should, at this particular moment, concern himself and herself or herself to deal help us with Puerto Rico. So basically, basically that's what my message is here. And I believe, I believe that Puerto Rico, for all Puerto Ricans, no matter, no matter where we live, Puerto Rico has to be the promised land of all Puerto Ricans. And And this is the moment to struggle and to make Puerto Rico that promised land, that land, and to transform Puerto Rico into the identical country that it has the potential of being. So I thank you very much. And I want also to say this. I have in my heart a profound gratitude to all Puerto Ricans and to every single person who helped with the campaign for my excarceration. I would not be here, I would not be here if it was not for the solidarity and the support that has been given to us, has been given historically to Puerto Rican political prisoners. So my heart is full of gratitude, my heart is full of love, and I will say this, que viva Puerto Rico libre. mentions that when Nelson Mandela was released from jail, South Africa had changed a lot, and he had changed a lot. So the question for you, uh, Don Oscar, is um, in what ways your ideas have changed um, since your release? I, I think that the biggest change has been the fact that I was hoping to see a different Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. uh, and that I was expecting to see better conditions. And what I found was a, a Puerto Rico that uh, has been thrown deeper and deeper into poverty. Mm -hmm. Puerto Ricans have been forced to leave Puerto Rico mm -hmm. more and more. And one time, Don Pedro Albizu Campos wrote something that probably has some meaning to us today. He said, the U.S. government wants to cage, but not to bird. 
And, and we see today more and more the possibility of the cage being there and us not being there. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I would say that that's part of the sadness that I feel, but I'm also hopeful because we have to be hopeful. Mm -hmm. To lose hope is never an option, okay? Mm -hmm. So no matter how difficult it is, no matter how bad the situation looks, we can always move forward. So I hope that we understand that too. This next question is somewhat related to what you were saying. The, um, the question is, how do we, what do we do to explain to people that it's still worth it to stay on, in the islands in Puerto Rico? Um, what do we do when there's so many of us here? I, I think that, that there, are ways, there are ways that we can stay in Puerto Rico. And, and we welcome, we should be welcoming Puerto Ricans to come back to Puerto Rico. How is it? If we, if we change the governmental structure, if we change where the interest of the Puerto Rican people comes first, not the interest of anyone else, but the interest of the Puerto Rican people, if we, we can do it, we can do it, we can create jobs, we can create a better and stronger Puerto Rico. I'm, I'm gonna use an example. An independent Puerto Rico would have from nine to 12 miles of water. We can use that water to develop a fishing industry. I grew up in a Puerto Rico where Puerto Ricans used to fish, what we used to call, it's, 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 a, it's a nice, nice uh, 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 chinchorros. And, and the chinchorros was a net and the people would go out in the, into, the, into the sea, into the water, and take the, the net and drop it, and then later on go and lift it. And it was an artisanal way of doing uh, fishing. But if we went around Puerto Rico, we would see that kind of fishing all over Puerto Rico. Yes, yes. yes. Today, today, because we cannot compete with a big ship they can come in into the Puerto Rican, what are Puerto Rican waters, and they can fish there. Why can we not have the ability or the, 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 need, the things that are needed to fish in the waters? Those are our waters. Let's have the waters. Let's have access to the water. We can do it because we used to do it. We can use that water also as an alternative source of renewable energy. Yes. We can use the waters to develop, to develop uh, ecological, uh, uh, beautiful water. Yeah, we can go there. We can enjoy the water. Some some kind of uh, ecological tourism. Mm -hmm. We can do it, mm -hmm. and we can also plant. Yes. See, we you know, exactly. you know, something that is important, something that is sold. So, if we have access to those waters, we can begin mm -hmm. the process of becoming self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. So that's a way to look at the future of Puerto Rico. And I'm only using an example. I can use many examples yeah. to make Puerto Rico a better place. I would recommend, and, and this is something that we we're trying to work on, is the whole thing of urban gardening. We can take every roof in the San Juan area that is flat and right on top of those roofs, plant yes, and, yes. And, and, and grow things. So I'm just using a, a couple of, I don't want to take too much of the time explaining it, but we have the capacity to do it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So the next question is like, how do we get there? What are some of the political issues that are impacting Puerto Rico? How to, what would it take for Puerto Rico to be free from the boot of the US and for us to be voting again and again? What are some of the things that the, the Puerto Rican diaspora, the people on the island, what are some of the realizations that we need so that we get there? I think, I think that you know, the answer can be very simple. We have said that what we need most 
is to transcend to transcend our way of looking at colonialism. We can begin to do something that we have not done in the past. We have called for unity, but we have not been able to transcend that mindset of, I have this political party and I'm part of this political party and this is the solution. No, no. We are, the solution, the solution will come if we find harmony among ourselves. Yes. And if, yes. we undertake, if we undertake the task of working hard to transcend, to transcend the little, little problems, little differences that are, we should be able also to celebrate our differences. That's right. Because yes. there's no need to have you know, allow the differences to stop us from doing what needs to be done. That's right. yes. So I think, I think that let's put aside the little differences and let's work towards something that is meaningful to all Puerto Ricans. That, that is, we can work towards the decolonization of Puerto Rico. We can go this year to the UN, demand from the, uh, from the General Assembly to take the issue of Puerto Rico. I would say that we could go to Switzerland and demand, demand again, for, for, for the international community to take its responsibility for the case of Puerto Rico because it behooves that international community so-called UN, to deal with colonialism because colonialism, they have been voted over according to law, according to international law, Puerto Rico has the right to be a decolonized country. Colonialism is a crime against humanity, so let's go to the UN, we can do it this year, and say, hey, listen, yo, we want Puerto Rico to be an independent and decolonized country, okay? So I think it's, it's not that hard, it's not that hard, but do it with love. I, I, I think that the magic, the magic in the Puerto Rican heart is that Puerto Ricans have a lot of love for Puerto Rico in their hearts. Let's use it and let's make Puerto Rico the nation that it has the potential of being. Two questions are about the, the messages that we bring to our children. So what are some of the lessons that children can learn from your experience of resistance? And also what are some for educators, the educators of our Latinx children here, what are some of the messages that we can give them about the glorious history of Puerto Rico? Uh, first of all, let me say this. Your children are the future of each society. So it behooves all of us to really, really look to make sure that children will have the opportunities that they need to be critical thinkers, to be, to be daring to question everything. That when they open up a faucet and see that water, they should know where that water comes from, what is inside that water. We should be able for children to question everything. And, and to be, to be, to have access to the things that are meaningful in life. For example, children should have access to the arts. Children should have access to the music, to the museums, to everything that is creative. They should not be exposed to hatred and fear, to guns and violence. They should not be exposed to those things. We can, we, can, we can do a lot, a lot with children, especially, I think that the most beautiful profession in this world is that of the educator. Yes. I believe... <laughs> I believe that education, you know, is through education that we can really elevate ourselves. And, and, and the good thing about human beings is that we never stop learning. You know, we, 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 we accept at a certain age that we can no longer be functional, or that we can no longer do things positively. Every human being, no matter how, what conditions the human being is in, that human being can make a contribution. Mm -hmm. so, so how is it that we garnish? How is it that we come together? How is it that we, you know, doesn't matter, doesn't matter how old we are, the conditions that we're in. We can be of service and help each other and 
make make our contributions, yes. especially to the children. Yes. Okay. What are your thoughts on the progressive movements in Latin America? How do you see a free Puerto Rico being part of it? And also, what would you say to a young revolutionary here or anywhere um, wanting to do his or her part, their part, for the Puerto Rican people? I, I, I think that anyone, anyone who's concerned with freedom and justice is welcome to do anything and everything that they can do for Puerto Rico and help Puerto Rico to become an independent country. In, in, in regards to, to countries that uh, are progressive, in, in 19, I think it was like 1996, I was in prison, and this man walks into a, 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 an audience and he says, la coca no es cocaína. And, and it, that, that voice, it was just a, like a hunting voice. And all of a sudden, you know, they, they identify as Evo Morales. And, and why, why was he saying this? And, and, and it made a lot of sense to me. La coca, no es cocaína. And little by little, little by little, he kept on working and working and working and working. And in spite of the fact that the United States government did everything possible not to allow him to be president of Bolivia, he was able to become president of Bolivia. If we look at the unemployment rate today in Bolivia and compare it to 2004, we will see how much, how effective Evo Morales has been in Bolivia. Just one example. Just one example. Should we, should we not celebrate what he has achieved in Bolivia? I, I was surprised and, and really, really, really happy to hear the Pope say when he arrived in Bolivia, he asked to be pardoned for all the bad things that have been done to Bolivia. And he asked the church to do everything to repent and to do everything possible to undo all the damage that had been done to Bolivia. And, and he also thanked Evo Morales for what he was doing, the great things, because it is this man, you can see the love in his eyes and how he speaks about the struggle that he has to wage in Bolivia, to elevate Bolivia. So I think for me, that's a good example. I also, I also have a, a profound admiration for Jose Pepe Mujica. Jose Pepe Mujica. Jose Pepe Mujica spent 10 years in solitary confinement. Worst confinement. I, I experienced terrible conditions in prison. But my conditions were nothing in comparison to what Jose Pepe Mujica went through. Yet, Jose Pepe Mujica came out of prison more humble than when he went into prison, better prepared to address the issues of the Uruguayan people, doing things that I had never seen a world leader do. Take a Volkswagen, take an operated tractor, live in a very humble, humble home and tell the world how important it was to make this a better and more just world with examples. So I think I'm citing those two examples as two people that we can emulate who are worthy not only of, of us and our love and respect, but I think the world to have love and respect for them. And I think that emulating their examples are worthwhile uh, D. There's no option. There's no other option. You know, imagine a human being without hope. Imagine a human being without dreams. 
imagine a human being. What kind of a human being are we if we don't have hope? If we cannot see, uh, there, there's a there's a there's a, a, a young girl right here, you know, uh, and and I, I see her right, and 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 I see children, and I see, you know, that we have to have hope at least for them. If we don't, hey, you know, if we don't have it, hey, let's throw it. Let's let's show them that we are hopeful people, because. There is no option. There is no option. We cannot. If we lose hope, we lose ourselves. And what is a human being without hope? Or what is a human being without without music? Or what is a human being without art? What is a human being with, without love? Okay. So yes, be hopeful forever and ever. What are your thoughts on the Jones Act and how it's affecting Americans, American citizens um, in Puerto Rico, not having the same benefits as American citizens here in the United States? I, I think that the Jones Act is, is something that uh, if people study it, and, and a person has any 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 kind of uh, thinking objectively, the first thing that, that the person should say is, hey, erase that, throw that in the trash. Uh -huh. Because it is trash, it is trash. <laughs> the, the cost of living in Puerto Rico, the cost of living in Puerto Rico is so high. Because if we buy some sweet potatoes from Costa Rica, the ship goes from Costa Rica to Florida uh -huh. and from Florida to Puerto Rico. Yeah. So we are yeah. automatically paying, automatically paying yes. for that transportation from Florida to, mm -hmm. to Puerto Rico. Why should we be doing that? I mean, if we bought it in Costa Rica, let, let it come from Puerto Rico directly yes, yes. into Puerto Rico. Yes. The Dominican Republic is only only 40 miles away from Puerto Rico. If we get anything from the Dominican Republic, it will come first to Florida and then to Puerto Rico. Why can't we, hey, we can probably take a boat board and go into, uh, into, into uh, the Dominican Republic and get it. So, so, so I, think, I think that anyone who reads the Jones Act and has any sense of respect for freedom and justice, uh, would you say, hey, dump that, throw it away, erase it, erase it, eradicate it, get it out of the system, you know, get it out, out of, because it's, a, it's, it's the worst kind of law that we can ever see. Thank you so much. Our hearts are filled with gratitude. It's always so inspiring to hear you speak, to hear you sharing your experiences. So thank you so much. And thank you so much for coming to Worcester. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna escort them over there to the end. Everybody line up and behind that black uh Yeah, so please wait till we take them over. And then we go be behind that uh separation uh banner over there and you can line up and go around. We're gonna move to the to our musical
Mike Dizia Pagan, Marta Rodriguez, Yasmin Hernandez, uh, Esperanza Martel, we interviewed, who was the interview? Other women on the island and women that were visiting the island at the same time that we were, about what they felt like their stories of resilience were during these times. What were the teachings that they were receiving from this time period? And a lot of that resonated with what I've heard Oscar talk about today. So I wanted to share this song inspired by that journey that we went on, and it's called This Is.
And it's a song that we've been doing for a long time. And we performed the song at the Women's March on Washington last year. And we continue to sing it. It's written in five languages. It's in Zulu, Chihuahua, Kiswahili, Spanish, and English. And it's a song about us coming together, just like all Scott talked about, coming together with our different languages, our different ways of knowing and understanding and being in this world, but coming together with a common vision and a common purpose for love and for justice and for
everybody so hard to make this happen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.